Welcome to episode 34 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying it to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Hearing the Voice of the Unheard. It's the first of a multi-part series on race-related matters. Regular listeners may think the title sounds familiar. That's because it is. Episodes 29 and 31 were both intended to be the first two of a series on race-related matters. And then I hit a downturn. As part of my 2021 relaunch, I decided to pick things back up where I left off. And since the relaunch includes video and a discussion-style episode, it seemed best to just start over. With that said, let's dive right in. Hey everyone, glad to be back. Excuse me for a moment, if you don't mind. I'm gonna have a bit of a sip here before we get started. Ah, it's delicious. Okay, let's get onto the show. When protests and riots broke out last year, I observed many people spending a great deal of time talking past each other. You know, what I want to do is spring from the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter issue because it's really more than just two phrases or even two competing sides. And it comes in two different forms. Maybe it's a dispute between saying black and all. Or maybe it's one person saying, you know, they should have just followed orders. While another person says, you need to consider your white privilege. We argue about systemic racism but what we don't talk about is systemic lack of listening. To address the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter issue, we need to go beyond those words and even ignore them altogether because the root of the divide, it goes deeper. Liberty Dad is about leading us to a different kind of conversation. It's about breaking down barriers and challenging ourselves to do better, to be better. Now, a certain amount of telling does come with the territory when producing a podcast, but there is an opportunity to demonstrate listening. And so, today, instead of telling anyone how they should understand, I will tell you how I understand. In this episode, what I'm going to do is play a roughly 10-minute clip of Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, The Other America. At certain segments... I will stop and then tell you what I heard. During some segments, I will give a short historical background under the assumption that if I was unfamiliar with those things, some of the things that he mentions, others may be as well. You'll find the link to his entire speech in the show notes, and I encourage you to watch it in full. It's only about 45 minutes. With that said, we'll start at the 14 minute and 10 second mark. Here's Dr. King. Now, the other thing that we've got to come to see now that many of us didn't see too well during the last 10 years, and that is that racism is still alive in American society and much more widespread than we realize. And we must see racism for what it is. It is a myth of the superior and the inferior race. It is the false and tragic notion that one particular group, one particular race is responsible for all of the progress, all of the insights, and the total flow of history. And the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately Inferior. The first thing I hear is a concise and specific definition of racism. Comparing that against a Google search defining racism, which says that it is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular race or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. But here's the thing, from Dr. King, I hear racism is any claim 
of superiority or inferiority on the basis of race, and that such a claim is said to be evident in the progress or behaviors of a people. But here's the thing. What I don't hear is the typical victim or who the typical victim of racism is. But let's keep listening. In the final analysis, racism is evil because this, its ultimate logic is genocide. Hitler was a sick and tragic man who carried racism to its logical conclusion. And he ended up leading a nation to the point of killing about six million Jews. And this is the tragedy of racism because its ultimate logic is genocide. If one says that I am not good enough to live next door to him, if one says that I am not good enough to eat at a lunch counter, or to have a good, decent job, or to go to school with him, merely because of my race, he is saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. To use a philosophical analogy here, racism is not based on some empirical generalization. It is based rather on an ontological affirmation. It is not the assertion that certain people are behind culturally or otherwise because of environmental conditions. It is the affirmation that the very being of a people is inferior. And this is the great tragedy of it. I say that however unpleasant it is, we must honestly see and admit that racism is still deeply rooted all over America, is still deeply rooted in the North, and it's still deeply rooted in the South. In the prior segment, I heard a concise and valuable definition, and now the logical end of how racism is experienced. Genocide. But then, then I hear something uniquely different. Dr. King tells me what racism is not. It's intriguing because I really can't think of a time when someone defined racism and then clarified what it isn't. Typically, somebody just tells you what you're doing is racist. They don't really come back and say, Okay, so you, that you understand what I don't think racism is, is this. And asserting a group of people are behind because of observable conditions, according to Dr. King, it's not racism. But asserting that they are behind because of some ontological affirmation or something other than observation, it is. My takeaway here is that observations about drivers for a group's lack of advancement, those things can be tested and verified, and then we can determine if they're true. And if so, they can be changed. Starting with the belief of naturally inferior or superior group, and then using progress or the lack thereof, well, there you're not dealing in evidence. Let's continue listening. Now, this leads me to say something about another discussion that we hear a great deal, and that is the so-called white backlash. And I would like to honestly say to you that the white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. It's not something that just came into being because shouts of shouts of black power or because Negroes engaged in riots in Watts, for instance. The fact is that the state of California voted a fair housing bill out of existence before anybody shouted black power or before anybody rioted in Watts. It may well be that shouts of black power and riots in Watts and the Harlems and the other areas are the consequences of the white backlash rather than the cause of them. What it is necessary to see is that there has never been a single solid monistic determined commitment 
on the part of the vast majority of white Americans, the whole question of civil rights and on the whole question of racial equality. This is something that truth impels all men of goodwill to admit. Here, Dr. King is speaking about events that I was less familiar with, so I had to do a little research. Let's learn a little bit about the Fair Housing Bill, the Watts Riots, and finally, the phrase Black Power. The Fair Housing Bill, which I believe is the Rumford Fair Housing Act of 1963, it was supposed to prevent landlords and property owners from refusing to rent to members of the black community. California then passed Proposition 14 the following year, which nullified the Rumford Fair Housing Act. The Watts riots were a six-day period of unrest, and that is putting it lightly. It resulted in 34 deaths and roughly $40 million worth of property damage. The Watts riots occurred between August 11th and August 16th, five days, in 1965 and they were initiated by a minor roadside altercation between, you guessed it, police and a black family. And then finally, activist Stokely Carmichael popularized the term black power on June 16, 1966. This speech came in response to the shooting of James Meredith by a white man while he was on the second day of a 220-mile march called the March Against Fear. This help was held in Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. And the plan had been to fire up the crowd with this new phrase when Stokely happened to get arrested. Unshaken, his peers told him that they would get him out and they would have the crowd ready. Later that evening, he said these words. This is the 27th time I have been arrested and I ain't going to jail no more. The only way we gonna stop them white men from whooping us is to take over. What we're going to start saying now is black power. And that is a brief summary of the relevant history in this portion of Dr. King's speech. The Fair Housing Bill in 1963, the Watts Riots in 1965, and then the first use of the phrase black power in 1966. And then Dr. King gave his speech, the one we're listening to now, the following year in 1967. Knowing that, the question is, what did I hear from Dr. King? Well, what I heard was riots and phrases like black power are be, as being the cause of the white backlash, which was the argument at the time, were actually an incorrect view of the chronology of events. There first was this issue of fair housing as an example where black Americans were being denied housing. Along comes the Rumford Fair Housing Act of 1963, which says black Americans cannot be denied housing simply because they are black. But then it's nullified one year later by Proposition 14. And then two years later, Stokely first popularizes the phrase black power. And in between, we see the riots in Watts, and then again in different cities years later. I can understand why Dr. King would suggest that a white backlash was really the driver and not the response. But to get an even better picture, let's continue listening. It is said on the Statue of Liberty that America is the home of exile. It doesn't take us long to realize that America has been the home of its white exiles from Europe. But it has not evinced the same kind of maternal care and concern for its black exiles from Africa. And it is no wonder that in one of his sorrow songs, a Negro could sing out, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. What great estrangement, what great sense of rejection caused the people to emerge with such a metaphor as they looked over their lives. What I'm trying to get across is that our nation has constantly taken a positive step forward 
on the question of racial justice and racial equality. But over and over again, at the same time, it made certain backward steps. And this has been the persistence of the so-called white backlash. In 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery. But at the same time, the nation refused to give him land to make that freedom meaningful. And at that same period, America was giving millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that America was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor that would make it possible to grow and develop. And he refused to give that economic floor to its black peasants, so to speak. And this is why Frederick Douglass could say that emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger, freedom to the winds and rains of heaven, freedom without roofs to cover their heads. And he went on to say that it was freedom without bread to eat, freedom without land to cultivate, it was freedom and famine at the same time. But it does not stop there. Again, we have to dive into some history. First, remember, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Lincoln on September 2nd, 1862 and it changed the legal status of almost 4 million people. Did I say second? I meant 22nd. And it changed the status from 4 million people from slave to free, basically black people to black Americans. Now, earlier that year, the first of the Homestead Acts had been signed by President Lincoln. These laws offered a method to obtain ownership of land to Americans that were not that when the land was not privately owned already. Then you have the Southern Homestead Act of 1866, and that was passed to compensate for failures of the 40 acres and a mule issue to provide black Americans land. This becomes the basis for the words of Frederick Douglass from his speech in 1875 that Dr. King mentions. Douglas and others were complaining about blacks being terrorized by various groups in the South. Others, in response, complained that they had done enough for blacks. It's a bit long, but it's very worthwhile. Here is what Douglas said. It's said by some, we have done enough for the Negro. Yes, you have done a great deal for the Negro. And for one, I am deeply sensible of it and grateful for it. But after all, what have you done? We were slaves, and you made us free, and given us the ballot. But the world has never seen any people turned loose to such destitution as were the four million slaves in the South. The old roof was pulled down over their head before they could make themselves a shelter. They were free, free to hunger, free to the winds and rains of heaven, free to the pitiless wrath of enraged masters, who, since they could no longer control them, were willing to see them starve. They were free, without roofs to cover them, or bread to eat, or land to cultivate, and as a consequence, died in such numbers as to awaken the hope of their enemies that they should soon disappear. We gave them freedom and famine at the same time. The marvel is that they still live. What the Negro wants first is protection to the rights already conceded by law, and secondly, education. Talk of having done enough for these people, after 200 years of enforced ignorance and stripes, is absurd, cruel, and heartless. Today in the South, the schoolhouse is burned. Today in Tennessee, Lucy Hayden is called from her inner room at midnight and shot down because she teaches colored children to read. Today in New Orleans, and in Louisiana, and in parts of Alabama, the black man scarcely dares to deposit the votes which you gave him the right to deposit for fear of his life. We want your voices again. Now, what I hear Dr. King telling me is that the environment of the 1960s was very similar to that of the 1860s. 
100 years prior. And that was for each action that America took to help improve the lives of black Americans, there was another action that either stifled the first or completely obliterated it. If It's like saying if you're free to vote, but then saying, well, voters must pass a literacy test, knowing that certain members were already far behind in literacy. And that was a problem, and that's what they were complaining about. Let's continue. Let's listen on. In 1875, the nation passed the Civil Rights Bill and refused to enforce it. In 1964, the nation passed a weaker Civil Rights Bill. And even to this day, that bill has not been totally enforced in all of its dimensions. The nation heralded a new day of concern for the poor, for the poverty-stricken, for the disadvantaged, and brought into being a poverty bill. But at the same time, it put such little money into the program that it was hardly and still remains hardly a good skirmish against poverty. White politicians in suburb, suburbs talk eloquently against open housing and in the same breath contend that they are not racist. And all of this and all of these things tell us that America has been backlashing on the whole question of basic constitutional and God-given rights for Negroes and other disadvantaged groups for more than 300 years. So these conditions Persistence of widespread poverty, of slums, and of tragic conditions in schools and other areas of life. All of these things have brought about a great deal of despair and a great deal of desperation, a great deal of disappointment and even bitterness in the Negro community. Today, all of our cities confront huge problems. All of our cities are potentially powder kegs as a result of the continued existence of these conditions. Many in moments of anger, many in moments of deep bitterness, engage in riots. Okay. Following the previous words of Frederick Douglass, I again hear America has introduced actions to help improve the lives of black Americans. But then America engages in other actions that become obstacles to the first. After referencing the past, Dr. King provides a modern example. And because of that half-hearted effort, many black Americans feel great disappointment, despair, and even bitterness that occasionally leads to riots. And now we're getting to the heart of the message that I am hearing. Let's continue listening. Let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that nonviolence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve, that in a real sense it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way, continue to affirm that there is another way. What I hear King telling me is that in no uncertain terms that he opposes riots. In simple terms, they are counterproductive, making the situation worse. And then he goes on to say this. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to 
feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. It is in this segment that I hear the commonly used phrase, a riot is the language of the unheard. But King starts by telling me that it's in opposition to riots, that, that opposition to riots is incomplete without also considering what leads up to those riots. It's two sides of an unwanted coin. On one side, you have rioting. On the other, you have freedom and justice that have not yet materialized for black Americans. When I listen to Dr. King's words, and I dig in where I'm unfamiliar, I hear a man who's telling me that many promises are unfulfilled, even stifled. I hear a man telling me he isn't speaking on behalf of an ungrateful community, but one that's dealing with repeated broken promises. I hear a man telling me there is another way to view the divide between white Americans and black Americans. And I hear him telling me that black Americans ultimately want what was found in the words of Frederick Douglass, and this was protection to rights already conceded by the law, and secondly, education. Did I get that right? Maybe, maybe not. But as the saying goes, don't listen with the intent of answering, but with the intent of understanding. Because without truly understanding, at best, I cannot offer my best. And at worst, I have nothing to offer. I hope you enjoyed the first of my series on race-related matters. I'll dig in even more in future episodes even offer some of my own thoughts. But for now, let's have a bill review, shall we? But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Hey everyone, I'm back. The goal of the bill review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Now, since I'm not a lawyer, this isn't a legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from page or two all the way up to thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. In observance of Black History Month, I'm going to focus on bills related to the black community. If you've been paying attention to the news, you know that President Biden has recently signed quite a few executive orders, and at least two are related to the black community. Today, we're going to take a look at Executive Order 13995, titled Ensuring an Equitable Pandemic Response and Recovery. This executive order is only four pages long, and don't worry, I'll post the link in the show notes. It has four sections, the purpose, COVID-19 health, health Equity Task Force, ensuring an equitable pandemic response, and then its general provisions. Here's what it says in the purpose. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated severe and pervasive health and social inequities in America. For instance, people of color experience systemic and structural racism in many facets of our society and are more likely to become sick and die from COVID-19. The lack of complete data, disaggregated by race and ethnicity, on COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates, as well as underlying health and social vulnerabilities, has further hampered efforts to ensure an equitable pandemic response. With that purpose in mind, we can start looking for what the executive order intends to accomplish. This executive order creates a task force, and its biggest sections are focused on membership, its mission, and data collection. A fair summary of those three sections is this. The task force will be composed of heads of various government agencies. Their job is to review how current pandemic responses are distributed to state, local, and other U.S. territories. They will also identify where data collection falls short and may get in the way of distributing these resources. And then finally, they're to offer recommendations and submit reports to ensure that pandemic resources are distributed equally. Sounds great, right? This task force will exist until 30 days after accomplishing their task, or two years from the date of the order, whichever comes first. Unless, of course, it gets extended. You want me to further summarize this? How about this? The task force is a fact-finding group. That's it. Nothing they do immediately impacts anyone, and their work may not ever impact real everyday people. The reason is because the task force is not starting with facts, but more of a hunch, and it uses kind of clever language to make it seem like they've identified a specific problem to solve. Let's take a look back at that purpose. Remember this line? For instance, people of color experience systemic and structural racism in many facets of our society and are more likely to become sick and die from COVID-19. That and, it combines two independent ideas, but it doesn't connect them. It claims that people of color are more likely to become sick and die from COVID-19, but what it doesn't say is that it's because of systemic and structural racism. That's just added. And that makes sense when you read the rest of the executive order and you realize that it really is just a fact-finding order. But that was all said in the purpose. In section one, it said, the lack of complete data disaggregated by race and ethnicity on COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates, as well as underlying health and social vulnerabilities, has further hampered efforts to ensure an equitable pandemic response. The obvious question here is, if there is a lack of complete data separated by race and ethnicity on health issues related to COVID-19, then how do we know there is a lack of equity? Think of it this way. Suppose that I claim not enough black men were producing podcasts, and then I admitted that I didn't really have necessary data on how many black men even wanted to produce podcasts or how many currently were. I would have no basis for my claim, and neither does this executive order by its own admission. That's not to say that everything is equitable. It may not be but you cannot make the claim without some evidence to back it up, even if the claim is intended to produce a good result. One more thing that I would like to point out. In Section 2E, it has this to say about funding. Health and Human Services shall provide funding and administrative support for the task force to the extent permitted by law and within existing appropriations. At first, this sounds pretty good, right? No additional funding. But this task force may operate up to two years or longer using money the government has already appropriated for health and human services. This is the government version of your boss's boss identifying a team or a group of people to perform certain duties and then telling your boss 
that all the funding must come from the department's existing allotment of money. More work, no extra money. I want you to remember this simple bill review the next time you hear the government needs to raise taxes or that a department doesn't have enough funding. Because when you hear that, you should immediately think, have they added more work without money? And if they have, then that's your clue why some of these government programs don't work. It also tells you why we need to start reading these bills so that we know what the government's doing, what they're asking for, and what actually is included. In this particular bill, in two years, what I want you to ask yourself, my final question, what I want you to ask is, in two years, if the program went that long, how would I judge the merits of this program? How would I know that it worked? It doesn't identify any particular group of people getting anything. It talks about reports and other things. So that's your question. What can I expect? What is the measure of success for this bill? Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time.